Welcome to not Clear Mountain Monastery. Ajahn. Ajahn. So today we're here visiting Birken Forest Monastery near Kamloops, British Columbia. And for those of you who don't know, Long Porsona, the abbot here, um, has been one of our mentors and guides and just such a wonderful supporter of both of us moving into the Pacific Northwest. And this is the second time we've gotten to visit together. And honestly, we're so grateful to be here. One of the things we love about Long Persona's teachings is just this bringing in of a bunch of different disciplines, psychology, philosophy, science, um, into the Dhamma. And where often we encourage people to constrain some of their input of media and books to Buddhist uh, materials. As monks ordained for 10 plus years, honestly, sometimes we look at things through a Buddhist lens so often, it's actually really helpful to bring in other ways of viewing truth, um, even if they don't have quite the directness of the Buddha's original teachings. And so, when we're here in the Forbidden Library of Birken Forest Monastery, we decided we'd go through it and actually select a few books which we find interesting and to discuss. So, enjoy. That's right. So being here in the Forbidden Library, uh, like me, you're probably trying to read every single title on the shelves behind us. And it's called the Forbidden Library because it's not the normal library um, or just the library. Um, and this is something which you'll find in many libraries is there's a public facing library for day guests or for people who are coming for a short stay, which has the standard books of the Pali Canon, perhaps modern commentaries, ancient commentaries, uh, in our traditions, lots of basically the whole collective works of Ajahn Chah. And that's good to have this circumscribed set of teachings for people who are only at a monastery for a day or a week or two weeks. It, there's, you know, it's good to be able to sit with one's desire mm -hmm. for mental stimulation. And when the library is circumscribed like that, it really makes one come back to one's own resources. But when you're living in a monastery for longer, um, yeah, it's quite common to have something like this or other monasteries I've lived at, they call it the shadow library. And it's somewhere, a place where long-term guests or the monastic population can come and just relax a bit. We're given this great advice to read our own hearts, but sometimes that can be boring and it's great to read our own boredom. But if we're in this for the long game, um, yeah, if we want to be monks, monastics for our whole life, uh, yeah, figuring out how to read, how to read these books, uh, which are classics. And so for myself, when I've been at these monasteries, different monastics hold reading uh, of different types, especially reading outside of the canon uh, to be, yeah, some hold it as to be somewhat yeah, inappropriate. So when you're in a monastery, uh, one, you're never quite sure who's gonna come and what they're gonna think, so, oh. Ajahn Soda. Ajahn well, Soda. Oh. what a surprise. <laughs> what are you doing in the Forbidden Library? Uh, <laughs> let me explain Forbidden Libraries. This is a great tradition. And I hope that you have an opportunity to read a book from a, a Forbidden Library. It was called The Name of the Rose. And it is a Catholic uh, detective story about monks in the 13th century. And that library uh, had a labyrinth access to it. And then uh, s most monks were forbidden from going there and you could get lost in the, the labyrinth on the way. And it turned out that some monks were dying at that monastery and nobody could figure out why. So they sent a detective monk. This is along the lines of uh, Sherlock Holmes in the 13th century, <laughs> a monk from an another order, perhaps the Augustinian order, who's more on the rational side. And the reason why these monks are dying is that some of them can't resist going to the Forbidden Library to navigate through the labyrinth, which is deliberately set to keep you away from certain ideas. And they are actually, the books that are forbidden and dangerous are by Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates, and they're in the library. And by the way, this is accurate that, that the Greek philosophers were known to the uh, literate monastics of the 13th century, 12th century. And these ideas were considered quite dangerous. 
problematic, very expans expansive, you know. But they had um, poisoned the books, the paper on the books with arsenic. And so monks tended to lick their finger to turn the page. And so they would know who got into the secret library because they end up being poisoned. Now, this is a metaphor for their idea that these ideas might poison you. And in a sense, they were right. It did poison the pure faith ideas of the of the 12th century, and what sprang out of it is the Renaissance, a much wider look, and out of that, science, philosophy, and appreciation of logic developed from that as well. But we jokingly refer to this as the Forbidden Library. I like to, to have it. it. It intrigues people. And of course, people in a monastery, that they're, they're living here a long time, they will make their way to the Forbidden Library. And we, uh, I don't think the, the ideas uh, poison anybody. Um, they may be useful in some ways. And I spent much of my life reading uh, big honking books and uh, going to universities and so forth. And I certainly found that uh, some of the, the Buddhist ideas were restorative and released you from certain narrowness of the Western canon. And, but I don't find them harmful anymore. I'm immune mm. to a lot of persuasion, which is very healthy to, to go to the East and find out a way, different ways of thinking, and then you can come back and you can examine your own culture's literature and ideas without harm. Yes. Um, so one of our teachers, Ajahn Jayasara, will sometimes recommend for people who are just coming to the Dhamma to just stick to the Pali Canon for the first year or even possibly the first five years. I forget mm -hmm. his exact recommendation um, to kind of get their firm footing, you know, because not everyone is immune to all these ideas. I mean, it's a, I don't know, uniquely American, but perhaps um, yeah, definitely a Western thing. We have such an ecumenical background that yes. Um, we're picking anything and everything and just having this potpourri of spiritual experience. And I have heard about one monastery which had a right view section and a wrong view section. Mm -hmm. And pretty much they got rid of, you know, it was a very tiny wrong view section. That was just like the most blatant examples. But what do you think about that censoring or selecting? Actually, it's not a bad idea. Um, you really need to give the prefrontal cortex a break, and it's overdeveloped in our literate society. Um, it's a, you go to university and it's a bunch of random ideas, none of which you're expected to commit to. And you might find it quite uh, refreshing to step out of that for a period of years, and I have. I have systematically stopped reading for periods of years at a time, just for the experience of being more in direct reality, rather than seeing things through, through, uh, um, through the excess development of the written word, mm. which uh, can fool you into feeling that you know something. And this goes right back to the beginning of writing. Right? Mm. Socrates himself commented, if people take up this writing and reading, they will be mistaken about the sense of knowledge that they have about philosophy. Philosophy needs to be developed in discourse and conversation so that you really know whether you know what you're talking about, whether it's knowledge or just mere memory. And this, uh, of course, plays out in some of my studies now about the, the original writing down of the Pali Canon, etc. So the, the, this appearance of books changes things. It's not necessarily bad or dangerous, but you must be aware of the difference between unmediated experience of reality and conversation <clears throat> versus the, the virtual reality of a book and, mm. and this, this capacity to read. And it seems that you're imbibing knowledge, but later on when you close the book, what do you really know? But there are, of course, a whole range of uh, uh, books, and one, is, one side is uh, fiction, uh, beautiful fiction, which is sometimes much closer to the truth than hmm. nonfiction. Uh, the truth is stranger than fiction, um, 
and stranger than nonfiction as well. So uh, it doesn't hurt to read some novels from time to time in, if in the right context and to see insights from uh, great authors, great minds. I often advocate this for people developing metta and compassion. You know, mm -hmm. read Charles Dickens. You will be allowed to see through the mind of a, of a very compassionate and intelligent observer about the nature of how humans suffer and inequities in society. You might not have that. So single books have changed the whole course of society. They've developed welfare systems and kindness and so forth, both to humans and to animals, because of being able to see through the mind of a great person in a book. So there, there can be great um, good results from these things. I've actually heard that one of the beginning points of human rights, uh, universal human rights, was the invention of the printing press because it allowed for the printing of really widespread novels, which mm -hmm. allowed people to inhabit really and intimately the life of another person and mm -hmm. kind of this ability to connect with those that are much different than you, laying the groundwork for a much more universal conception of what it was to be human. and. Just this morning, we were talking about your that period where you pulled back from books, and I think you were in a hut for for years. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes without books, and sometimes just with the the Sudi Maga, mm -hmm. which is impressive in and of itself. <laughs> so, one thing that is interesting is you coming back to the Western canon, and suddenly with this Buddhist lens in in your mind, you're able to see this whole new vision of the books that you formerly encountered, and. One of the books that you've singled out that I find most interesting in this respect is, is Plato. Mm -hmm. And we happen to have him right here, The Republic. The Republic, yes. And one thing I found so interesting is Plato was one of the first philosophers I ever read. My dad, uh, he was his favorite. So, and I just remember the pages glowing with this mm -hmm. like light that I never found in the Enlightenment philosophers, ironically. Um, and it's very interesting because the Enlightenment thinkers look back on Plato through a very logical lens, but through a Buddhist lens, you realize not only does he talk about rebirth, but Socrates very likely had some form of deep meditative calm. Yeah. And Plato's been instrumental in your conception of the interplay of Indian philosophy and, and Western philosophy and the exchange of ideas. So tell us about Plato. Well, in, in fact, <clears throat> I have given a, uh, you can hold that for me, and uh, I have given a talk at the university, a whole talk on the Republic. I, I arrived there expecting the political science teacher. I, I, for some reason, I was at the university in, in Kamloops, and uh, I was talking about things. And he said, "Oh, you're, you, you have an interest in, in Greek philosophy. Uh, would you like to talk about that? I have a political science." I said, "Yeah, I'd like to talk about Plato." So I showed up there thinking I would be just part of the class, you know, twenty minutes on Plato or something, give it a kind of a different view. Turns out it's a three-hour class, and he expects me to talk for three hours <laughs> off the top of my head on Plato. I did, I did survive that. I actually did talk for three hours. But so, what's important here is the when you look at it. And I, I started university in philosophy, and and of course reading uh, Plato and Socrates and etc. They they're looking at it from. A, a strictly linear academic, uh, by the way, academic, the word academic is where Plato taught in the grove of academe, a mm. wealthy person who had donated a grove to Plato for teaching, and his name was academe, and that's where you get this word academic. In the meantime, in India, not perhaps in a similar time, the Jetavana grove donated by Prince Jeta to the mm. Buddha, so they're teaching in this grove similar times, and they're probably the only two what we call rational traditions, but they're not just rational traditions, and this is what is, ends up with academia, is it's just a rational tradition. They're hugely mystical in the sense that they're also interested in suspending the mere logic discourse and accessing something direct, and Socrates is showing this in the descriptions, which seems to go by professors and academics, that Socrates is reported standing for up to two or three days without moving. 
and the person describing this, at least the inter, you know the the words that they're in, in uh, translating is that he's thinking deeply. Nobody thinks deeply for three days standing motionless, <laughs> but in jhana, in the suspension of thought, which is known to Buddhism, it is possible. And there's all kinds of clues that both Socrates and Plato had access and were cultivating this for the mystical experience of the deathless. Mm. This uh, didn't quite catch on with Aristotle. Aristotle goes off and is the founder of science and logic and so forth. I don't think he got it. Mm. And that's that split in society. And this is why we're, we are returning it. We all went to universities and ate the menu and the menu is, it tastes like cardboard. Um, <laughs> ideas uh, cannot nourish you. You can't get calories out of them. So we're looking for calories. We're looking for actual existential nourishment. And that's where we, we gravitate to meditation and we discover Buddhism. There's both ideas directing to you to something, but not merely staying with the ideas themselves. It's not just the, the menu. You actually order the food. Yes. And John, we might be jumping around a little bit. Yeah, great. Um, but somewhat similar to yourself, um, I very much in line with this forest ethos, this Thai forest ethos, trying to do the read your own heart. Don't read the books, close the books, just read your own heart. Mm -hmm. But somewhat similar, like actually not feeling at that time, you know, 15 plus years ago, then mm -hmm. I just didn't have the heart juice to keep me nourished from exactly, that. And yeah. So then followed the advice from the Ajans to just uh, conscribe my reading within the Pali Canon. And that was, that was great. I mm -hmm. only had the six volumes of uh, I.B. Horner's Vinaya Pitaka mm -hmm. for you know, my years in Anagarika, yeah. which was, was interesting. But then my dad came down with stage four metastatic stomach cancer, I think in my first year as a fully ordained monk. And I think this was the first book that I read uh, after um, yeah, after this period of real fasting from any, certainly any kind of mm. literature, fiction. And my dad actually recommended this, The Death of Ivan Illich. Um, it just, he was realizing that he's mortal and that he's gonna die. And he's always had this um, great connection with uh, Leo Tolstoy has read everything that he's written and mm -hmm. um, yeah, so had this connection and curious what, what your experience is. Yeah, well, there's Tolstoy. a lot of Dhamma in uh, Tolstoy and in this particular, um, de the death of Ivan Illich is the denial of death. So he is mortally ill and he is, uh, as uh, the phrase goes in there that Tolstoy quotes from uh, Dreischwitter's logic, Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. And Ivan says, yes, as it applies to Socrates, that's true, <laughs> but not to himself. <laughs> you don't mean me. <laughs> all men are mortal. So uh, that's, in fact, I have written my first actual book, which is hardly a written book. It's actually a stack of photographs of a decaying corpse. I quote from uh, the death of Ivan Illich, that particular passage, um, Socrates is a man, uh, Socrates, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. As the, why we do death contemplation and why we do corpse contemplation, we're sent to graveyards to watch corpses decompose so that we get the idea, you know, this, you, that, and me, same, same. Uh, Tolstoy has uh, great insights into all kinds of things, and he, he picks up some Buddhist stories, actually, as well. The story, of course, about the, um, the man who's running, uh, escaping a tiger, and he's hanging on to a, 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 a root on a cliff, and below him is death, and above him is the tiger, and he sees a, a strawberry. He picks it, and, and how delicious. That is a, a late Buddhist story, not from the Buddha, but from a section of the canon, which is not actually being fully translated. It's got the, the Avadana or the Apadana. Mm -hmm. It's in the Gandharan region of, of India, what we call Afghanistan now. 
Tolstoy somehow has that story in his, these Buddhist stories had drifted around. He'd heard some of these things. Mm. Uh, so he was influenced by this as well. And yeah, Tolstoy is war and peace as well. You'll see this experience of religious, uh, religious transcendence. There's a, a story about a, du a duel mm. where a man is challenging, he's, he's interfered with another man's wife and everything. They, they go out and they're, do at the moment he he understands what am I doing this poor man and he decides you take the first shot you just... mm -hmm. so he has a moment of transcendence right in the middle of this and this is only you can only understand it if Tol Tolstoy could only write that if he had it himself and he did he is uh, in the end of his life he's giving away uh, fortunes and liberating the serfs and himself practicing renunciation and he's also a pacifist He's influenced by uh, a sect called the Dukabors. Mm. And then of course, he and, he and Gandhi are both influenced by pacifism. And interestingly enough, by a, an American, Henry Thoreau. Yes. Mm. Their essays influence Tolstoy and Gandhi, and then they influence the 60s in the United States. Why do you think they're walking up to soldiers with, with flowers? Yeah. Yeah, the 60s and then 70s, 80s, it, 90s. It all goes all around, and, and yeah. the reason why it goes around is because of books yeah. and essays and so forth, yeah. What I find interesting is <clears throat> I feel like Tolstoy, War and Peace, was my, my favorite book before I ordained. For me, like, Tolstoy does have some flashes of brilliance, but he also was, he never came to peace himself. Even to the end of his life, he kept trying to wander off to a monastery and failing and falling to his vices. And for me, it's like ever since... The West lost its monastic archetypes, you know, either in the Reformation or in the, you know, as kind of the renunciants became less and less prominent yes. in the Western world. <clears throat> I feel like Western culture, especially American culture, has been starving for that archetype and trying to lay that mantle onto our, our artists. And, you know, Tolstoy's got flashes of brilliance, but, mm -hmm. but he's not the role model you need. And... But, you know, Bukowski is certainly not. Um, so for me, it's By interesting. Way, you mentioned <laughs> yeah. Bukowski. I don't know whether our audience is familiar with him, mm -hmm. but um, Bukowski himself is, is, a, is a bit of a rascal and, and interesting. But he, he did comment. He said, I read War and Peace. I'm a better writer. <laughs> <laughs> That's something would Bukowski, Bukowski would, would say. say. <laughs> yeah, Bukowski had a, a tragic life and never um, just, you know, reduced his suffering. Tolstoy, it, it's a good point. So I also had uh, actual uh, t conversations with Father Thomas Keating. Mm -hmm. And he was very interested in Buddhist meditation techniques. And so he's bringing it into the uh, Catholic monastic structure. And he, he said, well, basically we did this up to 16th, 17th century, and then it fell away. And we lost it, and then we just, we're busy all the time. We're just working. You know, uh, the Benedictine slogan is uh, work and prayer, mm -hmm. but mostly it's work because the prayer gets, after 20 minutes, uh, now you don't know what to do. <laughs> so somewhere in the, it's because of the Renaissance and literacy and scientific inquiry and rationality that the other side fell away, which is a great loss. And why the center cannot hold if you don't have the, the ability to enter the stillness? Because you see in reports before that, they were, mm -hmm. I think they were entering jhanas and so forth. They were describing these experiences. After that, uh, they get interested in things like uh, genetics and so forth. So right. uh, yeah. you have some monks who are living in sort of science monasteries, uh, developing uh, genetic studies and, and all, all kinds of inventions as well. They're losing a lot, and they must recover it. Yeah. Well, this is might be a good uh, bridge for bringing in some of these other books, and maybe yes. we could switch. But it, it's so good because it really did. You know, I can read it in the monastery in California. My dad can read it as he's dying yeah. in Michigan, and similarly with any book. You know, you can have this connection, this virtual long distance mm -hmm. connection which can actually be quite deep. And it seems like that's what we're trying to do as well these days with uh, video and different platforms. So really look forward to 
looking more deeply into some of these books and how they've affected you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've moved down to a more comfortable position and have just picked uh, a selection from the several hundred books that you could see on the forbidden library shelf over there. And really it was just the ones which we found which immediately called to us, ones which we've had a relationship with, read, possibly read once or more than once and had some effect on us. And yeah, we'll just slowly move through these and we might have a lightning round at the end, so. You want John? So to begin with, we have The Seven Story Mountain by Thomas Merton. And we just touched on the subject of Christianity and Ajahn Sona, what would you have to tell us about this book in terms of how you've looked or worked with it? That was a delicious book to read. Um, Thomas Merton was a Trappist monk, and I think I could relate to him as well. He, he ordained as a Trappist monk when he was 27 years old, and he uh, remained in the, in the robes uh, until he was 54 years old when he died. And he actually died in Thailand at a conference. Trappists are the uh, very uh, austere and uh, cloistered uh, monastics in uh, the Catholic Church. What I found interesting was, and, but by the way, he's a very, an excellent writer. Um, his, all of his books are superb. And, and, and in some ways that he ended up mostly supporting Gethsemane Monastery in Kentucky by through the sales of his books. He decided to write his autobiography at, at the ripe age of 34 years old after being a monk for seven years, this seven-story mountain. And what an obscure idea, uh, but it ended up being a New York Times bestseller. Like, what a strange idea. I also like the fact that his attitude is, he's a very bright fellow, and he did, uh, is a phrase which I use, he said, in the 20th century, for a man to become a, a monk in this time, in this place, especially in the U.S., is a scandal and an outrage. And uh, it is. Uh, it seems for many people, this idea of the, the monk is, is some sort of stone castle in Europe in the 15th century or 14th century to do this in a modern time and be a, a modern person. And he was a very well-educated, very talented person. He had spent the up to the age of 27 a lot of time in New York City in jazz clubs and uh, dating women and uh, being a, a rather a good time guy. But it turned out to be shallow and meaningless. And so he, he entered in a very sincere way into this contemplative life. But what's interesting about him is that he, in the, the midst of this cloistered Trappist life, he discovers the East. He discovers Buddhism and contemplative practices. And because I think he found their own capacity for meditation and silence and so forth inadequate. They didn't, they had lost it somewhere along the line. So he's the first one who's uh, giving credibility to Zen. So he writes a book called Zen and the Birds of Appetite. Um, he, he practices with, uh, again, with uh, the Theravada. He encounters uh, the early Buddhist suttas. And he becomes an admirer of these and benefits from them. And he, he, he writes about them and he, he says, you know, we can, we can learn from this. It's high time the men of the East and the West met. Of course, he he's, doesn't understand that they met a long, long time ago and we forgot about that. But we'll get to that sometime. Mm -hmm. the, the early Westerners uh, who became Buddhist monks in India. But anyway, he's sort of re he's replaying out history. The encounter of the, of the, the Western mind and the, the Catholics with this profound wisdom and contemplative practice of, of Buddhism. Eventually he does go, now this is after this seven story mountain, you'll see uh, his, his journal and he travels, it's called the Asian, uh, the Asian journal. In the end, he gets permission from his abbot to go and actually visit the Dalai Lama and he does, and he goes and visits 
uh, Nyanaponakatera in Sri Lanka has conversations with him, and then goes on to Thailand, where he's at a conference um, and gives a talk at the conference, goes up, has a shower, steps out of the shower, attempts to turn on the fan, and is electrocuted. <laughs> uh, so that's the end of his life. Um, a fascinating life, a great writer, and I think we can relate to it because he's he's one of the early ones striving for the the, the contemplative life that is faded in the in the Catholic uh, monastic practice, and other monastics like Father Thomas Keating and so forth, who established this uh, centering prayer, are also influenced by Merton, and so whatever contemplative practice they've restored often has been influenced by contact with Buddhist ideas or even Buddhist monks. And so Merton is a, a very interesting, a lot of people love uh, reading Thomas Merton. Um, he's an interesting character. And I, I read this stuff and I appreciated it. And much to my surprise, I ended up actually going to Gethsemane Monastery with it in a in a conference with the Buddhist and Catholic monks and priests on uh, green monasticism. And while we were there, we said, you, uh, would you like to see Merton's hermitage, which is still there? So we went out there and I sat down and, and her, I realized, I'm, here I am, and I just read about this, you know. And when I was reading it at first, I think, wow, he's been a monk for so long, you know. Now, of course, I am. I've been a monk much longer than Merton did. He he died at, after twenty-seven years as a monk, and I've been. I'm a monk for now for thirty-six years, and it's really flown by. It's really not that long in the robes. Yeah, I was thinking about some interesting parallels I find with Christianity because it's been a very interesting thing to try to integrate into my practice. Is you know, first um, I've heard someone say. <clears throat> Um, Christianity sort of aestheticized suffering and just some of the poetic and artistic language in the Christian tradition I find resonates at a kind of a deep intuitive level with a lot of Westerners, um, which is interesting to see if you can invoke or use in a skillful way sometimes. Um, and like just the word angel versus the word, word deva for me like resonates quite deeply. Um, and then Merton's art is just, his writing's profound or beautiful. And then also the mystical tradition there, I find, you know, for example, uh, uh, Meister Eckhart, you know, uh, Long Parpanya Vado says he likely was a stream enterer. And, you know, St. John of the Cross, you find really interesting descriptions that sound a lot like Jhana. Um, so I find that interesting thread as well, and with the Desert Fathers. And then you have this whole esoteric side where um, it's interesting, like, when I began to look into uh, tales of exorcists near the Vatican, a lot of the descriptions of what they worked with, with like possessions, were very similar to descriptions of Mara. And like, that was kind of a fascinating little um, exploration as well. So yeah, I found that to be a pretty uh, interesting realm to kind of explore a bit as well, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, the insights, um, I think there was a book called uh, The Jesus Seminar, and it's 50 uh, basic theolo th theological scholars have been meeting for over 35 years. Mm -hmm. And they are looking with clear eyes at the historical Jesus. They're attempting to recover the historical Jesus. And their conclusion was that he was a secular... Uh, Teach, Hellenized secular Jew. Um, they discount the um, miracles and so forth. But what's interesting is that there were, what were his ideas and where did they come from? And if he's Hellenized, meaning Greek influenced, then uh, some of the Greek ideas, this is 500 years after the Buddha. The Greeks have been in Northern India for those 500 years. They're fully acquainted with uh, Buddhist ideas and, and uh, monastic ideas. And how much of that, how many of these ideas drifted and were infused into Greek thought? And the Greeks, of course, were dominant in that area. How many of them filtered into 
uh, the ideas of Christ and so forth. And of course, the you know the New Testament is first written in in Greek, and the so the people who are writing down his sayings and everything are are attempting to record it in Greek, which is the international language of the time. So it's it's an area that can be uh, uh, explored, and I think at, having gone outside of Christianity to Buddhism and just immersed in that, you come back and look at the New Testament and you, you, you understand it better than many Christians because you, you understand what's being said there. there. There are ideas that are in much in Buddhism as well. Uh, the curious parables and, and ideas can be understood through the lens of Buddhism. As, uh, you know, it's very interesting. And I think if you didn't have that, you, you almost can't understand uh, Christ, or this, or what, what remain, what we have of the sayings of Christ. And by the way, it's very, very. There's small amounts. You can write all the sayings of Christ on two sides of a napkin. It's uh, versus the Buddha. The reason why is Jesus didn't live very long, and the people around him weren't very uh, developed as disciples, and. Whereas in Buddhism, you have a huge collection. You have 45 years of uh, voluminous teachings preserved by people who were advanced disciples and knew them very well and knew the meaning of these things. So that's a, it's a great source for learning and then coming back to explore these later ideas in Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it can be really useful to see these connections between... Christianity, the cultures that we grew up in, and how it shapes our own take on on the Dhamma. I mean, connections. This seven story mountain in particular, you know, was connection between my myself and my grandma. You know, when I was becoming interested in monasticism, you know, could give her that book, and she could, even though she's Methodist, you know, not Catholic, but okay, here's someone who's totally given their life over to Jesus, and could get some kind of picture of where I was headed. Um, mm -hmm. Connecting that, just hermit life. Um, next book I hope to go into is Henry David Thoreau's Walden. So this is a, a book which was big for me. I took a class when I was in university, Hampshire College, on the transcendentalists mm -hmm. and reading this when I'm you know, 20 years old or something and just finding it so inspiring that he can go off and, and live in this way. And uh, yeah, I. I think we're going to be having an interview with you sometime soon, actually, about living as a living as a hermit, uh, the do's and don'ts of that. So, what role has Walden and played in in your in your life? Oh, it's it's a very important book for me. Um, I uh, was exposed to that in my twenties, and I it. it confirmed an, uh, an inclination that I already had. I, I think from child, early childhood, I always uh, had a, you know, an impulse towards this hermit life in the forest. It just always appealed to me. And I spent a lot of time, even as a very young kid, playing in the forest, staying in the forest, being in the forest. And it just has an indelible effect on me. And coming across Thoreau, Brilliant writer. I, f I feel that's the best book in the history of the United States. The, the, the most important and best book. How do he, how does he how did he understand at that time? Now this is the eighteen forties to be just before the Civil War. Um, he is he's an observer of of society. Of course, he's deeply critical of the whole issue of slavery, and so he just can't understand it. That area, of course, and his, his neighbor is, and his older friend is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Mm. Another character in the neighborhood is uh, Hawthorne, the, the author of Hawthorne. This is a tiny little village, Concord, and they produce this incredible um, number of influential thinkers What's going on in Europe at the same time? Nietzsche is is later than Thoreau. Um, Thoreau is has gone to Harvard, by the way. You know, it's, you think of him as he's very critical of university, and he's saying, "Ah, you waste your time with that." You know, it'd be better off to learn practical arts. But he did go to Harvard, and it's only twenty miles away, 
And he, he walked back and forth on a number of occasions, you know, 20 miles back and forth. By the way, I was just at Thoreau's cabin on Walden Pond, and I there's, have some nice photos of me leaning in the doorway. They've, it's, a, it's not the original cabin, but it's a, an exact replica of it. It's right on Walden Pond. And I finally made my uh, pilgrimage there. Thank you very much, Henry. I mean, uh, Henry is kind of endearing to me as well. He, he's an untrained hermit. He doesn't know if he can manage this. He feels he needs to. The shallowness of society is, is not impressed him. He needs to be alone. But he goes there and he says in the, in the beginning, I went there to taste my fate to its very core and rind. And if it turned out bitter, at least I would know it. And not when it came to die, realized that I had not lived. To suck the very pith from yeah. life. Yeah. yeah. To experience direct, undistracted reality. And so that solitary life, and it, it's, it's a daunting experience, and most people would never dream of doing it. And so it's a, such an important contribution. And it, in a sense, he skipped back over all of the development of philosophy and so forth in the West, back to the, the earlier uh, practices of the Greek philosophers, and who are more existential philosophers. They're more engaging in this kind of practice. And of course, connects with Buddhism. He did the first translation of the Heart Sutta. Sutra. Uh, it was he, he read it in French and translated it into English. He's the first one to translate the Heart Sutra into mm -hmm. English. And of course, as he said, he bathed in the Bhagavad Gita in the morning. He said the Bhagavad Gita makes all of our literature seem trivial. <laughs> <laughs> How he discovered this? He, he's he's a genius. Uh, somewhere roaming around in the Harvard Library, he came across this. But, uh, of course, to, to even uh, consider another religion outside of Christianity as possibly interesting or valid would be shocking at that time. Mm. And he initiates so many things. So one of these uh, essays he wrote is called Civil Disobedience. And then I find out this... This is, I like to trace these threads mixed from all over the world. People influence each other. So that, that civil disobedience influenced two people, Tolstoy and Gandhi. You think Gandhi, India, the Bhagavad Gita, no, where did he get his strong inspiration? From reading Thoreau. Yes, Gandhi is reading Thoreau. And what's Thoreau reading? The Bhagavad Gita. And who else is getting influenced? The great... Tolstoy, and who becomes an advocate of pacifism, uh, etc., and is also engaged in this passive, uh, passive resistance, uh, nonviolent resistance. It's Thoreau that's doing this. This is remarkable. Uh, it's, it's such a rich um, his attitudes and his turn of phrase. Now he's a great. He's a master of English, and has great turns of phrase. It's almost poetic. It's just, it's, uh, you, you can be swept away just reading it. If you're the right personality, other people think, why doesn't he become a social worker and do something <laughs> with his time? You know, he has more influence on reform and changes in society. By, by going and doing that, he realizes things that you can't realize when you're too busy all the time. You know? For those who don't have time to become a hermit in the woods, I read recently they've just made a video game out of Walden Pond. Wow. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, interesting. How, yeah. To emulate the hermit's life, um, you do need companions. So he was not certain that he would come out sane. He, he, he worried in his first year that he might have, he might experience insanity, but it, that's what it takes. The humans are social creatures, and we don't know what what extended periods of solitude would do to us, and that's why we're afraid to, to do it. But if we have enough integrity or sanity, then it can be the one of the great uh, experiences in life. And of course, go back to Christ. Remember, he spends 40 days in the desert. 
and has a very similar experience to the Buddha. Mara comes and tempts him. So we, we, it may well be a, trans, a transmission of that story of the, the period in the wilderness by the, the Buddha and finally him having this confrontation and coming out the, the winner despite the confrontation with Mara or the, the devil and so forth. This may have been 500 years earlier, so that story can have drifted and influenced that, that story. St. Anthony as well, 500 yeah. years, yeah. about 400 mm -hmm. years after Christ. I mean, mm -hmm. totally tempted in the desert as well. Yeah. Those stories are drifting around. You see them in the Desert Fathers as well. Um, uh, of course, the Bodhisattva, the, the, before he was the Buddha, he was called the Bodhisattva. Uh, the stories are in the Jataka tales, and those tales end up familiar to the Desert Fathers, the early Christian monastics in the desert, uh, have a saint, Josephat, which is really the, the transformation of the Bodhisat, and the, he becomes a, a saint in the Catholic Church. There is a church to Saint Josephat. They only found out in the 18th century that this is the, actually the, the Buddha, that the, <laughs> they made the Buddha a Catholic <laughs> saint. Uh, because he is, a, he is a solid, these the lifetimes in the Jataka are often, he's a, he's a hermit, he's a solitary, Etc. And he endures these difficulties and comes out. And so these stories inspire them. They don't know where these stories come from. They don't realize that it's not a Christian saint. It's a, it's the Bodhisattva. <laughs> I think we will circle back around to in the shape of Angela. But um, actually, I thought to first ask about uh, a short history of myth. Mm -hmm. And you and I have talked about um, kind of these interesting parallels between. Buddhist mythology and cosmology and what you find in the uh, Olympic gods, um, in Greek, Roman mythology, and in Norse mythology, and just the commonalities. I mean, Norse Valhalla, although they uh, categorize it as heaven, honestly seems a great deal like the Asura realm. Mm -hmm. You have Buma Devas in terms of the Sith people um, in the Celtic mythology, the fairies. Um, the Tavatingsa realm in Buddhist cosmology maps very well onto uh, Greek uh, mythology. And then Dante's Inferno seems directly out to, of the Petavatu. Mm -hmm. So what, do you, what would you have to say about kind of the, just that thread of myth in terms of tracing out that cloth from different... Well, this is a golden age of the connections here. First of all, you know, people saw similar stories and so forth, but it's actually because of genetics that we are understanding something. Two things, migration patterns can now be traced through genetic, genetic history. This is only in the last eight or nine years. Uh, ge genetic, uh, ha genetics have become sophisticated enough to see back generations and generations in a person's genetic structure, and they can, they're tracing the migration patterns down through the Middle East and into, from the steppes of Russia, from the Eastern Europe, into India. So the Vedas, etc., cetera, uh, didn't originate in India. And uh, as well, the language, the Sanskrit language didn't originate in India. It originated in what we might call Eastern Europe or the, the Caucasus and so forth. And due to various climate situations, migrations pattern happened or migration flowed. And they had common cosmologies, which spread. Some of them went north into the Vikings. Some of them went into Eastern Europe. Some of them went down into what we would say Spain or Greece or uh, even Egypt. Some of them went to India. And so these cosmological stories and so forth are in common, but they are separated for such a long time that people have forgotten that 4,000 years before, they're actually related to the people that arrive 3,000 years later. Uh, they don't recognize each other. Uh, but they, they share certain elements of language. So you'll see this is the Indo-European language families. Latin, Greek, uh, and uh, Pali, Sanskrit, have all kinds of common uh, parts to them and, and grammatical structures as well. 
this is a golden age of this. This is the reconnection. The history is, we're understanding the history and the interplay of these things, which were, for various reasons, uh, part of it is the imperialism of Christianity itself. Part of it is the imperialism of these em empires, like the British Empire, that, you know, come in and just take over India. Uh, uh, and you also have uh, racism as well and classism uh, and so forth. So this is a new age where we can actually see that, oh, wait, there's all kinds of connections. We're connected in all kinds of ways. So it's a golden age of, uh, it changes archaeology, changes history, changes our understanding of languages and so forth because of this a new breakthrough in uh, genetic structures. And so... It's not so mysterious that these myths have common, are common in these different areas. But that doesn't dismiss the idea that these are realities that people are commonly experiencing. One of the areas, like this, this commonality between yakshas in, in ancient uh, India and Sasquatch in, in uh, the, the North American Indians. So long before the, the white person arrived in uh, India, in uh, North America, the Indians have all these reportings. Similar structures, everything about these, the, the Sasquatch and the Yaksha are similar. Thunderbirds and Garudas, very Garudas, similar. Garudas, yes. And Nagas, the right. giant sort of serpent, uh, di um, serpent dragon type uh, beings. Uh, by the way, they're, uh, they're also shifting, sometimes able to shift into a human form for a period of time and deceive people. Um, this uh, is, happens in, in uh, South American mythology, uh, etc. cetera, you, the, the winged dinosaurs and winged uh, dragons and, and they're, they're highly intelligent, etc. It's amazing, the, the common connection. So... Is it merely ancient stories, or is it a an intuition of realities that uh, that they were actually able to see? So, yeah. Yeah. Is this you saying Sasquatch is real, Ajahn Sana? I'm saying that it would make more. What 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 they're looking for is biological evidence of it. They want to find the skeleton of it. Now here we go. In the Melinda Panha, the Melinda Panha is a dialogue between a Greek king in India, one of the most influential Indian kings is Greek. His name is Menander. He came, he's about 150 BC. His, uh, he produced coins for his empire and, and on these coins are images of the Buddha. He's an appreciator of Buddhism and we have a famous book by him and he inter is a asking questions of a, of a Buddhist monk named Nagasena. Nagasena is supposed to be an arahant and a Abhidhamma scholar so that he can answer this king's very sharp inquiries. Now, the king is from the Greek tradition, which has uh, inherited Aristotle's logic and so forth. He's from a very scientific idea. He's very curious about Buddhism. So this book is preserved. In, in almost in the Pali Canon. One thing I, by, by the way, one thing I, I, I know about Nagasena is that his teacher was the Abhidhamma master, Dhamma Rakita, who is, guess what? A Greek monk. His, he's a Yonaka, which is the word, the Indian, the, the Indian or Pali word for the Greeks. So Nagasena's, uh, uh, Abhidhamma master was a Greek monk who is a, a, a Greek Buddhist monk. So the circle was around, and one of the questions that Nagasena asked, he says, I have heard about these, these yakshas who are like giant hairy beings, you know, and they're quite, it's quite, it, do they really exist? So he has a very scientific do they really exist? And Nagasena says, yes, they really exist. And he says, well, why don't we find remains of them? Where, where, where don't we find the skeletons of them or something like this? And Nagasena says, oh, because when they die, they don't leave skeletons. What the remains of them look like are the shells of insects. 
And that's the only trace of the remains because they're not fully from this dimension. They're, they move in and out of this dimension. Yeah. So in the case of Sasquatch, we're looking for hardcore, some sort of biological specimen from this dimension. And that's what's so mysterious. Like they, people see it. It's got a terrible smell. It's dangerous, weird encounters, but then you, you can't verify it. And it, but if it's, if it's passing back and forth between dimensions, maybe that's the answer. But that's right in, that's fifth century, that's, no, 150 BC. Mm -hmm. uh, a scientific question, and it's answered in a different way than we're looking for it now, so. Very interesting. Yeah. And is that a history of myth that you recounted about, yeah, I mean, Sanskrit, Yes. Perhaps driving from earlier. Is that actually in Karen Armstrong's book, or would you have a better? Not in Karen. Book no, no she's that's well. Uh, David Reich, uh, who we are and where we came from, uh, is the best book to read, <clears throat> and we don't have it on our uh, micro shelf of books, uh, but you will see the patterns all articulated and all of the DNA samples and so forth. And so there, there is very with great confidence they can show this. It's been known for quite a while that the, the Sanskrit originates not in India. Now, by the way, if anybody from India is listening, if I said this in certain circles in an Indian university, I might get kicked out. Um, I might because it's a point of nationalistic pride in India that Sanskrit, so that the present party that's ruling the place is kind of a right wing nationalistic thing. They're trying to reestablish their identity. They were under the British rule until 1948. It's a terrible thing. Now they're trying to get their own sense of nationalism and pride and so forth, but they're, they're, they have invested heavily in, in their own myth-making and they're in denial of the actual history. So there is just a huge amount of evidence that Sanskrit doesn't originate there. The, the Vedas and, and the Brahmins migrate and it's very primitive Sanskrit, which is developed, the, the refined Sanskrit we, we find now is developed in India, but it's not, the Sanskrit doesn't, the roots of it doesn't come from there. Yeah. Speaking of yakshas and weird beings, weird entities, so this is just <laughs> one book which you might find in a shadow library and we found here in the Forbidden Library. So this is a story of Jim Jones and uh, I won't say whether I read this as a layperson or as a monk, uh, but it's a thick book, almost 700 pages, but basically the history of Jonestown and of Jim's Jones, who was this cult leader in the <coughs> 60s, 70s, and then ended up leading a group of about 900 people to commit suicide, to drink the Kool-Aid. They were yeah. the first ones to drink the Kool-Aid, and I'm always fascinated just, why aren't we a cult? And to be able to read books like this, which we're definitely not like Jim Jones. And i um, curious why uh, it's in the library and what you found useful in this book, if you read it. Yeah. Well, I have to investigate all kinds of uh, claims and philosophies. And I think it's my duty to. Uh, not every monk needs to do all of this stuff. I, I, it just happens to be the way my mind works. And I, I find it easy to read these things and connect the threads in history and so forth. But I find it somewhat of a duty to under explore this, the dynamics of how these cults develop and how, uh, how, why people join and why they stay in them when it's, when it's clear that there's deep corruption and uh, et cetera. So Jonestown is the, is one of the big, marks on uh, on history. Of course, uh, Hitler in itself is, is, this is just trivial compared to the Third Reich. What, what was that about? How did that happen? That people just handed over their mind and just took that up as a supreme value and would do anything that was asked of them. How did they, how does this happen? And if we're not, if we're not students of this history, we, we won't give good advice to others and we, we need to examine ourselves in, in terms of uh, what, we, what we're willing to believe, etc. So that uh, is a very thick book and it's very well written um, exploration of this personality. Uh, 
there's dozens of those guys uh, in the world today. Uh, there's dozens of them in the United States and Canada. And they're still doing the same pattern. You know, these, these people are basically uh, delusion, uh, deluded and sociopathic and narcissistic. And that combination for certain people at certain periods of their life is very powerful. And then you get in a bubble of information and you can't, you're not allowed to break out of it and there's control, etc. So this is things to work for, uh, work out. And there are now good information about there's cult watch and so forth. And one should, you know, go through the list. And by the way, you'll, you, you will not find me on there. <laughs> you will find you or you on there. We're, we, our sangha and so forth have really had us maintain a good reputation. And the reason why is that we really are interested in the, the Vinaya, the, the rules of conduct for monks. And it's not a, it's not, we're not gurus. We're not, that is not our, we're not forming our own religion. And we're not personality centered we're trying to transmit these time-tested and evaluated over long periods of time. And explicitly in them is non-manipulation of people, no sexual manipulation, no economic manipulation, no violence, etc. are explicitly written into the Vinaya. And the reason it works so well for so long in a, in a, in an admirable way is because the Buddha laid down this Vinaya, which is a very difficult thing to do. The Vinaya are the rules of conduct for the Sangha and the, and the individual monks. And it just has little boundaries. And if you step over that, you're just done. You're just not a monk anymore. But that, gone. And it works very, very well. So it's a remarkable document by a, uh, a genius. And uh, this, has, this saves a lot of people uh, distress. And I think it's very good that we make ourselves available to people because people are seeking and it's very easy. It's not easy to sort this out. You know, if you're working uh, at Walmart and a, and a part-time job again and you're expected to sort out the world religions, I mean, come, come on, you know, like how, and philosophies, how do you make a decision? Uh, so we, we try to make ourselves available and try to, in, so my, my YouTube, thing is about education. So I'm just, I want to do basic education, clarifying things, ask the questions, all for free. You don't have to join any cults or anything. So that's how we do it. And you, you're also doing it that way as well. So it's very important that we understand these things. And, and some pe people still, this, is, this happens to be a graphically terrible kind of cult but there's other, all kinds of ones that are, still have decent reputations that really shouldn't have a decent reputation. All it takes is a little investigation to see how many gurus and so forth are really corrupt mm -hmm. and that they should, people need to be told, it's, it's not, this is not good. This, this uh, needs to be held up to the light of, of truth and if they can't define where the boundaries of behavior are, then you're, you, you should run away because uh, you need clear boundaries. What is the guru not, what line is the guru not to step across? Nobody is be above the law, you know. It also strikes me that our tradition encourages free investigation, which is a, a trademark of cults is insulating people from the wider, you know, ability to ask questions yes. as well. Yes. And, and Ajahn Sona, we are running low on time, and so we might have to enter rapid fire round. Yes, let's which, do the rapid fire round. So <laughs> we're going to go through the remaining books, one to two minutes per book. This is going to be painful for you to condense, Ajahn Sona, but you got an upcoming video about it, so it may be okay. The Shape of Ancient Thought. Well, thank you for actually recommending it to me um, some years back. I have been interested in the Greek and Indian uh, influences of each other for decades. And uh, Thomas McKeevely has uh, uh, put it together nicely. He's, he, he, he has fallen short in certain ways, uh, just a lack of, of information, which I hope to fill in. Um, but a wonderful book, 
as an, introdu an introduction to this and was met with some resistance initially, but it's becoming much more common the, to see the, the connections here. So I will leave that as the, the one minute round, yes. Yeah. And, uh, okay, Herman Hesse, Siddhartha, we just gave a talk on this, but would love to hear your take. Well, Herman Hesse, I, I read <laughs> every book that he ever wrote, you know, so I just love the guy. What a what a one what an amazing artist! I did. He, I think he won the Nobel Prize for he literature. Did, he did magic. Um, and of course, he introduced many many people to the the Buddha. I mean, that's a totally distorted idea of the Buddhism. But <laughs> uh, who can? Who, uh, so what? <laughs> it's delicious. <clears throat> Sometimes you just have to come through the the heart, and rather than the the cold, clear, rational mind. Um, it's a beautiful thing. But please. Uh, if you do read it, uh, do go on to read the actual words of the Buddha and uh, find out what it was really all about. But what a what a an amazing author, you know. We decided we both loved reading it, and yeah, we were a bit skeptical how exactly Buddhist it was. Um, <laughs> the next is Peace Pilgrim. Um, this book is not as well known as it deserves to be. It is. Uh, I mean, it was so moving for me to read, um, and kind of an American saint of sorts, but. Ajahn Sona, what are your yeah, thoughts on Yeah, she should be better known. Uh, and I, mean, I think she's not so well known because she's a woman. So let's correct that and uh, appreciate this woman. She's just decided one day that she was going to be like Jesus and renounce money and possessions and start walking along the side of the road. And if people gave her shelter or food, that's how it works. And it, that's a radical a decision and a radical it appealed to me greatly. I just wanted to do that, and I kind of did that. But um, uh, she kept it up till she was in her, her 80s. She's walking along just in a T-shirt, you know, not enough, like not even a sleeping bag with her, like no backup, just a trust mission. What an amazing story. What a remarkable person. Um, there's some amazing people. People are consumed by these, I don't know, billionaires and movie stars and everything, the really remarkable people are people who just decide to walk along the side of the road to demonstrate human trust, you know, and faith, you know, it's amazing. And she would fast until she was given food and yeah. walk until given a place to sleep. And yeah. and it's free online. You can just Google Peace Pilgrim PDF and it's completely... Yeah, free. remarkable. <laughs> Better than Forrest Gump. Yes. <laughs> and maybe Forrest Gump was based on that to some in some ways, yeah. So the final book, uh, 2022, neither of us have read it yet, but Gabor Mate, <clears throat> The Myth of Normal. Yeah, so Gabor lives in uh, Vancouver and is a well-known around the world, and his primary, his area of concern was that he, he was a suburban middle-class doctor who one day decided to go work in the downtown east side of Vancouver's uh, drug ghetto. And it is one of the worst in North America, maybe the worst. It's zombies all over the street, just, and his first book was called, uh, on this was called, In the Realm of the Hungry Ghosts. And he borrowed that image from Buddhism, the, the, the idea of the ghost that has a th very thin throat and a, a large empty belly, and it can never f find fulfillment and satisfaction and peace and ease. And that, that he, he realized that, that after treating so many druggies of extreme, th that that was the reason for their addiction, is that early trauma, early childhood trauma, uh, created and a lack of the capacity for the experience of love. The first time they took a, an opiate, it, it emulates the feeling of love. It emulates the feeling of safety. And immediately they're addicted and devoted to this because it's love. They're, they're in love with love. And they, of course, the drug is damaging and so forth. But this is the insight he gained. And then he, he begins to realize how widespread trauma is in this life. Now, we didn't understand it in the f First World War and the Second World War, shell shock and we'll get over it. And then they're alcoholics and so forth. And then, then we realize post-traumatic stress disorder. The, you, you have been traumatized. And the only way to, the pain relievers are the alcohol, the drugs and so forth. 
but it's you've got to understand the tr what trauma does to to people and that it's the root of these addictions and so he's explored this to a great and it, it it's a revelation for understanding the nature of addiction as well yeah well Lumpur, this has been just uh, a real joy love this format um, yeah, sometimes think about the Buddhist path as just a refinement, just getting better and better at happiness and better and better at the way that we feed and you know, figuring out how to uh, enjoy more and more subtle forms of, of well-being and input. And so, you know, coming to the monastery, we've given up coarser forms of addiction, but we still do have books. And being able to hear, you know, a teacher's reflections on them, it's really... It's really useful, and to hold all these things in context, uh, in a Buddhist context, is really so valuable. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lumpur. You're most welcome. Mm -hmm. And delightful that you're visiting uh, Burke, and you must come back again. Many times. <laughs> we would love to. And stay. <laughs> and I will try to get down and visit you as well. Um, I uh, have been mentioning that. I do want to go down and see the... Uh, scrolls in the University of Washington as well, the birch bark scrolls of some very early writings, uh, Buddhist writings. But that's for another time. You've been a foundation for <laughs> a slide board. Thank you. Okay.